Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Lecture 1 Skill Check. The purpose of these skill checks is after each lecture, there are certain ideas I want to make sure you have taken on board. The skill checks give you a chance to sort of assess your own learning. And so I, tend, I intend after each lecture to provide a few exercises related to what we did in class. You can do those on your own. And then to check uh, your answers, we have this video format. So hopefully this will help to facilitate your learning process to, throughout this course. For today's skill check, we're looking at the central limit theorem. And so one aspect is we need to know under what conditions this central limit theorem actually can be applied. So we're going to look at a scenario to, uh, to um, check out those conditions. We're also going to look at calculating the, the mean and standard deviation for the distribution of y bar, the distribution of a sample mean, assuming the population parameters are known. The population parameters mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma. And at the end, we'll just have a little review um, concerning using the z-table to calculate a probability. So to start with, let's just review this phenomena that we call the central limit theorem. The idea is this. If y is any quantitative random variable that follows any distribution, doesn't matter what it is, as long as we know what the mean of that distribution is and what its standard deviation is. So if this condition holds for an individual measurement, and if y bar is a sample mean computed from n independent random observations, if that holds, then the distribution of that sample mean is approximately normal. It has a center. Its center is the same as the center for individual measurements. And it has a standard deviation, which is, which is almost the same as for an individual measurement, except that it's actually something that's smaller because we divide by the square root of the sample size. Now, um, an important idea here is why is a random variable it has some variability, so each time you measure this random variable, you'll get a different value. That variability or spread is, is measured by sigma, the standard deviation. And you can see here that the standard deviation of a sample mean is always going to be something less than, this, than the standard deviation of an individual measurement. And that's an important idea, because what it conveys is this sort of notion that when you take an average, because you're using more than one measurement, in some way you have more information than you would if you only had a single measurement. And that increase in information is reflected by a decrease in the spread or standard deviation of that measurement. So that's an interesting idea, I think. Uh, in any case, let's look at something concrete. Oh, yes, and of course, we always must remember the approximation here gets better as the sample size gets larger. Okay. So here's the scenario. We're pretending that we uh, have a company that makes batteries for watches. It is known that the mean lifetime for one individual battery is 4,500 hours with a standard deviation of 350 hours. So the lifetime of a battery is a random variable. Now, as part of an ongoing process of quality control, we can imagine that the plant manager takes a random sample of 60 batteries every month and then checks out the average lifetime of those 60 batteries. So the first question was to explain why it is safe to assume that the distribution of the mean lifetime of a random sample of 60 batteries is approximately normal. So in other words, why is it safe to assume that the conditions for the central limit theorem to hold, that those conditions actually apply? So we'll look at that, and then we're going to calculate the mean and standard deviation of that average, that y bar. 
So first, let's just look at what we're given. Again, we're given that the individual lifetime of a battery follows some distribution. We don't know what that distribution is, but we know it has a mean value of 44,500 hours and a standard deviation of 350 hours. So these parameters are for the population of individual measurements. This is a population mean and a population standard deviation. So as I said, we're not told what the distribution of these individual measurements is, but the beauty of the central limit theorem is we don't need to know what it is. Because in the end, we're only going to make inferences about the mean value. And we're going to use the sample mean to do that. The sample mean under certain conditions will follow a normal distribution. And so it doesn't matter what this underlying distribution is. The sample mean will still be approximately normal in distribution. Of course, that's only provided certain assumptions hold. So first of all, we need to check the independence condition. We need to check that our data came from a random sample and that the size of that sample wasn't more than 10% of the size of the population. And so that actually is the case here. The sample, we were told, is a random sample. The sample size is 60 batteries, which certainly is less than 10% of the population of batteries the company makes each month. So we can say that the independence condition holds. And what that means is that we can assume that the lifetime of any one battery in our sample has no impact on the lifetime of any other battery in that same sample. So the batteries, their lifetimes are independent of each other. Second condition, we need to know our sample size is large enough. Now, again, we don't know whether the distribution of the, of the individual measurements is symmetric or skewed. At the very worst, it could be heavily skewed. But the good thing is we do have conditions under which the central limit theorem will apply. One of those conditions basically says, even if the underlying distribution for individual measurements is heavily skewed, as long as the sample size is 40 or more, then we're okay. We can, we can actually use the central limit theorem and we can assume that our sample mean follows a normal distribution or something very close. So here our sample size actually is 60, so that's definitely big enough for us to use the central limit theorem. So what do we have? We have the distribution for an individual measurement. We don't know what that is, but we know what its mean is. We know what its standard deviation is. We have these population parameters. We can now use the central limit theorem to say that the distribution for our sample mean is going to be approximately normal. It's going to be centered at 4,500 hours, and it's going to have a standard deviation, which, is, which can be computed from the standard deviation of an individual measurement and the sample size. That computation is quite straightforward. Sigma th is 350. The sample size is 60. We get a standard deviation for our sample mean of about 45 hours. And so we can say then that the sample mean is approximately normal in distribution. It's centered at 4,500 hours, and it has a standard deviation of 45 hours. On to question two. Here we're going to use the empirical rule to determine two values between which 95% of sample means are expected to fall. And so just to remind you what the empirical rule says, it says if you have a random variable that's normal in distribution, then you can expect about 95% of all of those measurements to be between plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean value. Here the mean value is 4,500 hours. And so we simply need to start from there. We need to go 4,500 plus two standard deviations, 4,500 minus two standard deviations. So two standard deviations in this case is about 90 hours. And so we'll just go 4,500 hours plus or minus 90 hours. And we get these bounds. There's the upper bound, there's the lower bound, 
we can expect about 95% of our sample means to be between these two values. Last question, what is the probability that the sample mean will be less than 4,416 hours? So this is the case where you're given what I call a value of interest, and you need to calculate an area under that normal distribution that corresponds to this value of interest. So let's draw a picture. Here again is the distribution for our sample mean. It's centered at 4,500 hours. The value of interest is to the left of that. And so what we need to get this probability, the probability that the sample mean will be less than 4,416 hours is the area in this lower tail. How do you find that area? Well, we need to determine first how far away this value of interest is from the mean. And when I say how far away, I mean how many standard deviations. Once we know that, we then just go to the Z table. So to calculate the number of standard deviations that separates the value of interest from the mean, well, first we just take the difference, and then we scale that difference by the standard deviation. So in the end here, we get minus 1.86. So what does this mean? This means that our value of interest is 1.86 standard deviations to the left of the mean of the distribution. How do we get the area in the tail? We need to look up this value on our Z table. So here's the Z table, minus 1.86. So we start by looking at minus 1.8. And then we, to get the second decimal place, we go up to the top, we look at the 0 0.06. And where those intersect, we get the area that is to the left of the z value, the area in that lower tail. So in this case, that area, 0 0.0314, that's about 3%. And so going back to the diagram, the probability that the sample mean will be less than 4,416 hours is 0 0.0314. It's about 3%. That's the area in the lower tail of the distribution. Okay, so that is it for this first skill check. Um, I'm glad you watched this. I think it will be very helpful for you to do these skill check exercises after each lecture and then to go to the video to check that you got the answer correct. Um, that's all for now. So I'm going to say bye-bye and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.